Bobcat Grizzly game, which is also called the Grizzly Bobcat game. <laughs> <laughs> this is a copper bowl at one time, the great divide war and the brawl of the wild. It was played in use from 1926 till 1954. In Uptown View, in the 20s, it was known as Roaring Twenties, nationwide, and Butte was no different. We had made it through the epidemic in 1918, the terrible epidemic, and some of the labor strikes in 17 and 1920. Our contract was in place for the miners, and America was becoming, on its way to becoming the wealthiest country in the world. Excuse me. Could you turn the microphone on? Yeah. Well, I thought she was. She had it on. It's on. Unless he's not closer. Yeah. There you go. Don't break it. Don't break it. That better? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit ahead on the pictures, but despite prohibition in Butte and in America, and it went on from 1920 to 1933. It was let the good times roll. And Butte may have had more speakeasies, early girly parlors, cigar stores than most any city its size in the nation. Some of the, this is the Winter Garden, I believe. The man who hired um, to enforce prohibition at the time turned out to be one of the most notorious and successful bootleggers. <laughs> Butte had um, nearly 70 hotels, 48 churches, 230 grocery stores, four theaters, an estimated population of 71,000 people and a large transportation system to move everybody. So in 1926, a guy named C. Owen Smithers started his own photo shop in Uptown View. He had arrived in the Butte and Anaconda area in 1921 after his service in World War I. Some of you may remember him carrying his camera around. It was called a speed graphic, it was the brand name of the camera. He had grown up in the Kalispell, Kalispell area and began learning the art of photography and the use of a dark room while working in his father's drugstore. In 1914, he became the first, one of the first press photography students at Montana State in Missoula's new school of journalism. Smithers' military service began when he volunteered with the Montana Volunteers in the Mexican Border War incident in 1916. He went on to serve as a mess sergeant in Company H, 163rd Infantry Regiment under General Pershing in World War I in France. He returned to active duty in World War II, and he was the Director of Photography of the Second Service Command, First Army Station at Governor's Island in New York. He was in charge of all the Army photography activities, including the classified missions. He covered the area of New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. As chief photographer for the Anaconda Standard in 1921 through 1923, he began putting his craft to work on the streets and in the mine yards of Butte, Montana, capturing the ever-changing landscapes of our city. In 1923 through 26, Smithers partner had partnered with Frank Ward and Tom Manning in the picture business. He went on his own in 26. Smigs, as he became known, was one of Montana's most pro 
prestigious professional photographers. For more than 50 years, he documented Butte and Montana history as it happened. The C. Owen Smithers Collection informs on the Butte environment, labor, women, society, athletics, and the military, and is unparalleled in its scope. Here's some of the stuff he did. In addition to being a photojournalist, Smithers was a collector of images of Butte and Montana. <coughs> Amazing and impressive collection, spanning a period from the 1860s to the 1970s. His images documented the development of early mining towns in the West, including the rise of Butte, Montana from the mining camp to a cosmopolitan city. They also captured the economic hardships felt during the time of the Great Depression. Smithers documented nearly every mining activity, fire, crime, major visitor, and everyday life in Butte from 1921 to 1972. He was active in the American Legion, the VFW, the Baghdad Shrine, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, the Butte Press Club, and the Kiwanis Club all of which gave him a personal role in the community. His son, C. Owen Smithers, Jr., joined him in the photography business and continued his legacy in Butte, Montana. <coughs> now on to the good stuff. <laughs> um, in 1925, Gonzaga, yeah. Gonzaga um, decided in, with the University of Montana at Missoula to come to Butte to play. And uh, it was because we think of um, all the Gonzaga and U of M alumni that were in the area. And they could get a good draw coming to Butte. It was also easy to get here. And, the more people that came to the game, the more they supported the universities. So in 1925, Gonzaga and Mont Montana State University in Missoula played a game in the Butte to the delight of 6,000 fans. This event may have prompted the Chamber to pursue their plan to host the game between the two largest funded colleges in the state. This picture is um, the University at Missoula playing Montana Tech. We think it's one of the first games, some of the first, at Clark's Park. Oh, wow. And both schools, Bozeman and Missoula, had come and played um, School of Mines in View. In April of 26, the team selected Butte to be the site of what was to be played on October 23rd, 1926. The Butte Chamber was instrumental in getting the game to Butte. Its athletic committee invited the warring colleges to come in 25, but plans had already been made to play the game in Missoula. The directors were assured that the Chamber would do everything in its power to make the classic collegiate football game a success in every way by underwriting the event. The game would be the latest addition to Butte's long-earned prestige in staging sport, sporting events. Butte in its past had hosted Scholastic Conference, which is high school championships, the industrial baseball circuit, big time boxing events, which this picture is of one, and all these brought lots of people to view from other parts of the state. In 1926, a guy named W.A. Clark, well, there's one of the boxing matches, um, offered a trophy called the Clark Trophy to the first team to win two games in a row. 
it was part of the promotion to get them all to come here. So now I would like to hand the microphone over to Dan Peters, longtime teacher, coach, and principal at Butte High School. I played at a lot of at a lot of Bobcat Grizzly games, but Dan actually played in three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and his son played four years at the University of Mosby. So Mr. Dan Peters. Uh, I'm going to try and talk about this microphone. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lee. <laughs> uh, when, I, when we first talked about putting this presentation on, um, they said, you're going to have to use PowerPoint. Well, when I got out of the education, they were using, still using slate chalkboard to get chalk. <laughs> and some radio creative teachers even used color chalk. <laughs> so they said, you're going to have PowerPoint. So I said, the only thing I know about PowerPoint is yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is my PowerPoint along with this. So, plus, I, I'm from the old school where I might walk back to JR if I'm paying attention. Okay, we're going to start out here talking a little bit about Clark's Park uh, because it has a very important part as far as this game is concerned. But when I started looking at that, I thought, geez, I don't know that much about Clark Park myself. So we did a little research into that, and I'd like to thank again the staff here. If you needed any information, they had it for you right away, and it was prepared, and you could find out exactly what you needed. So I would like to compliment the staff and the work that they're doing on this Smithers collection. It's outstanding. And it's be here for a long time, and a lot of people are going to learn from it. And I always considered, um, and Frank Quinn, who was a uh, editor of the Montana Standard, considered him a photographic historian. And I think that's a good description because his photographs uh, are history. And if uh, that idiom that uh, one picture's worth a thousand words is probably true as far as this collection is concerned. But I'm not going to use a thousand words with each. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> 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 We're going to start out by looking at some streetcars. We probably thought, well, we're looking at a football game. But the streetcars have a, an impact on this game and what went on in view. This is a picture of the streetcars on Wall Street by Clark's Park. I don't know how many of you are still familiar with Clark's Park or remember. How many remember Clark Park? Well, a few does. So, okay. But this is Wall Street, and this is probably in the 1920s, maybe 25 or so. Uh, but this was a terminal for uh, the Butte Railroad Company, which was owned by W.A. Clark. It was a, where the streetcars from uptown and the streetcars from on the flat came together, changed uh, passengers back and forth. So it was kind of a terminus for the, the, the whole area. And Clark built Clark Park right in this area over here. So the streetcar played an, an impact on that. Uh, there are some indications where as many as four to 600 kids would be at Clark's Park on a given day. And the only thing we can figure out is that they use these streetcars to haul all the kids from the uptown area and the ones that were living in the flat at that time to Clark Park and the, he had a recreational type playground there. And, uh, we assume that maybe he paid for the streetcars like he did for the buses up to Columbia Gardens. So the streetcars are important to getting people to Clark Park and getting people away from Clark Park. That's why I started out with the streetcar. All right, this is a panoramic view of Clark Park about 1920. This, looking at it, we're looking from the outfield in. So this would be west. This would be east. This is the east side of the hill. You can see some of the mine frames still up there. 
uh, is set up for baseball at that particular time. But you can see the type of stadium that existed and one of the attractions for bringing that game to Butte. All right, this is just a picture of it set up for baseball, 1925 about, you can not, notice the number of people, the grandstand, the people there. This is looking east uh, towards the Emerson, I guess they call it the Emerson area in that particular, those houses, probably some of those houses are still there. These are the grandstands that exist at Clark's Park at this particular time. Um, I don't know who the gentleman is standing there. But it shows you the type of structure that people were sitting on at that particular time. These are just planks. This is just a wood structure. That's another view of it from the back. Um, Those were the bleachers, not the grandstands. Right. Did I say grandstand? Said grandstand. Okay, they are the bleachers. All right. Thank you. Here's the grandstand. Here's the grandstand. There's a number of people. This is a game that was being played at that particular time. You can see the layout as far as the football stadium is concerned. This would be the West Bleachers. <laughs> so these are the West Bleachers. Here's the grandstand. <laughs> right. This was probably the bench of one of the football teams at that particular time. Another look at the bleachers. <laughs> okay. This was a picture taken probably later in the year, 1926. There's snow on the ground. It might have been at the Bobcat Grizzly game. We're not really sure. Uh, but I think with the number of people there and the crowd that uh, it was that game. Uh, remember, this is during Prohibition. And uh, I would wonder if anybody can estimate how many pints <laughs> or how many flasks are in that crowd right there. <laughs> the Boy Scouts were used as ushers. This is a 1931 picture. Um, so they showed people to their seats and kept, I guess, law and order in that. <laughs> and they look like their own military, but um, they were in charge of the ushers. This is a picture of the uh, scoreboard in 1926 that would be at the south end of the, the field. The movie Red Grange is being shown at the Rialto at that time, oh. so they're advertising. Uh, this was the uh, Jumbotron of the day. Uh, it looks very similar to any scoreboard that you would see. Rick Grange's movie was shown, so that's what's being advertised on that. So you can take that and you can compare it with Montana Tech's Jumbotron now. They're about the same, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> about the same. That's the Jumbotron of Montana Tech. That's the Jumbotron as uh, part part. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the field. This was a game in 1937. Uh, and you have to admire uh, Smithers from the fact that he was all over the field, up in the grandstands. If you watch his picture, some of them are up the bound looking down there pretty soon. There's the next one looking up. You're going to get the stick. <laughs> um, looking up at the ground. and uh, So you have to admire the guy. He must have been moving all the time, yeah. uh, taking those That's pictures. Picture. But this is interesting. This field is the outfield, basically, of the football field. And if any of you remember going there, there used to be a great big roller down in the end that they used to roll back and forth over that field. So by the time they rolled out all summer long, by the time fall got there, this was pretty hard. And they never ever dug it up or loosened it. We played right on that field. So this fine stuff came to the top. You can see the footprints in it. You know how that fine dust. So you had a little <coughs> dust when it was dry. 
So this guy's taking a nosedive into the dirt and dust. And this is 1937. This is the Bob of the game. All right. Now, they're taking care of this little bit of first aid going on here. I was kind of joking with everybody and said, the only thing they're doing here is sewing his ear back on. <laughs> but they're not. They're washing the lime out of his eyes. Oh, God. Now, you go back. Shouldn't be spending this much time. Took the nose dive. See that lime? They were made and marked with lime. That's oh. the same lime as people were using in their outhouses for disposal purposes. Oh you throw it down in their toilets or in their outhouses, and then they'd mark the field with what was left over. <laughs> 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 All right. So we got his ear sort of back on and his eye. <laughs> Notice those sleek cleats that he's, they're wearing now? Real fast shoes back in those days. <laughs> All right, now we talk a little bit more about the field. Moisture, any type of moisture meant mud. Yeah. So this is a Bobcat Grizzly game. Starting out, you can see number four. I think that's a six. I can't make out that number. So you can still tell a little bit about maybe who's who and what team it is. A little later on in the game, less, a little more mud, less. Note that the goal posts are on the goal line in those days. Wow. Now, who's who? Yeah, exactly. Which team is which in that picture? So the field conditions, now you have some idea what the field conditions were playing the games at Hart Park. But remember that everybody wanted to come here and play because they liked playing on those fields. They were hard and they weren't muddy like grass fields were where you were slipping all the time. Mm -hmm. So the, the teams didn't dislike playing on the dirt fields. All right, now we move to the uptown areas in 1926 to 37. Some of the things that went on as far as the game is concerned. This is a picture on Park and Main as one of the parades is ending. Uh, this is, a, I believe it's a freshman band from the University of Montana. They brought, newspaper articles say they brought two bands. So we figured one's a freshman band. One was a varsity band, I guess. Uh, but notice here, you the street cars. Mm -hmm. uh, those four, there's four street cars lined up there. Those street cars come right down, take those people right back down to Clark Park. So that's one of the reasons I had that picture to begin with, with the uh, street cars in it. The accommodations as far as transportation down to Clark Park were pretty convenient. All right, this is a picture of a grizzly bear cub. Oh, wow. Uh, this is 1927. <clears throat> a gentleman by the name of Frank Humbert donated or provided a grizzly bear cub to the University of Montana uh, Bear Paws. There was a group there that used to be called the Bear Paws. It was kind of an organization of uh, men at that time kind of in charge of this bear. Now, uh, they're giving the bear something to drink here. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's not, it's not clear. It's probably wine. It's going to be shot. Notice this guy with gloves and chains he's got. Here's a guy feeding him. Yeah. <laughs> Just sticking his bare hand out there and having a drink. If you've ever put food in front of a dog or anything, you make sure you get your hands out of yeah. the dog. <laughs> so they, he donated this bear cup to him and they had it for the parade in 1927. So um, I'm not an expert on bears. Is that a grizzly bear? It looks like a black bear. It looks like a black bear to me too, but we move on. And this is a little article about the bear being offered by Fred Humber. He owned the, um, Owl Cigar Store in view. And it was, cigar stores were also bars at that time. <laughs> Instead of calling them bars, and had to call them cigar stores because there was no pro prohibition, oh. so you could get by by calling them uh, cigar stores. But this is the gentleman that donated. 
And the reason he, he donated it is so they wouldn't, they wouldn't have to bring another bear on the train. They oh. leave the bear that they had in Missoula, in Missoula, bring this one. Oh. <laughs> well, in the Butte, they already have their own bear there. So. There's the bear cub again. This is 1929. I don't know if it's the same bear cub or not. But they did not have, at this time, they did not have somebody running around in a bear costume. <laughs> like he's nuts, or in a, a not, I don't want to be critical of that. I don't want to be critical of the bobcat. But that bobcat uh, mascot they used to have was a scrawny looking cat. <laughs> um, they did have, they did have a line bobcat too. Um, oh, there's a couple pictures of it. He's cute. cute. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. This is uptown still in 1926. That's the band marching. That's corner of Park and Main. Uh, these were the buses that were used in 1926 to transport the teens. Um, I think they're uh, safety coaches. Whatever that means. Uh, the thing that caught our attention here, it says the, the ride or the fare is 10 cents. We remember taking the bus uptown back in the 50s for only 5 cents. <laughs> so I don't know if they were gouging. Okay, this is, a, this is the band again at Park Park. But, the interesting thing I was pointing out on this particular picture, see this? That's all barbed wire. Oh my goodness. And it sticks out like this. It's barbed wire tangled like that so you couldn't crawl over it. Oh. Now, Jim Ugren was telling me yesterday he and his buddies could sneak in anywhere. <laughs> so I want you to tell me how you got over that fence. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I remember that fence. Don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> Back up town again, Bobcat Band going down where where they had anybody know? Which direction? Park Street. Park Street? Yeah. Going which way? East. Going east. Going east, going east right. Yeah. Going east on Park Street. Park and Main. Yeah, it's Park and Main. American Theater. They're back to the old YMC. There's this time on top of their walkers. And there's a Butte guy and his diggers. Right <laughs> Always find the guy in his big old ball. <laughs> Parker Man again, 1936. But look at this. The people. Yeah, yeah. Now this remember this is the Bobcat Grizzly game. The people that are there. And they didn't all come from out of town, so Butte supported that game very strongly. Uh, and remember 1936, that was probably the height of the Depression as far as Butte's concerned. 1936 again, Park and Main, same number of people, probably the same parade. Two, it must have been an election year because there's two signs up here, an O'Brien <laughs> and a Casey. So the Irish are running Irish, for something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is 1936. Those are members of the Spurs from, I assume, both schools. And then two police officers. Uh, I assume that might be the captain. There are stripes on their sleeves. One has two and one has one. So I'm not sure who the police captain was at that time. One name that came up was Walter I. Shea. So that could have been. One of those two gentlemen, I imagine, got the two stripes. Another picture of the parade. We assume this is Montana State because they're pulling a farm wagon. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure on that either. There's the bear cup again. This is the later. This is in 1937. I'm sure it's not the same bear because he'd be pretty good sized for 20 years. Yeah. 27 to 37, so they must have got a new bear. But they always had a live one. They still don't have that guy running around the suit. <laughs> All right, now I took a, little, a look at the games. 
the 26th to the <laughs> All right. Now this is a game at Clark's Park. Again. Notice the dirt field. Look at the dust coming up in that. What else do you see that's kind of different there? No leather helmet. No helmet. Oh, that guy doesn't have a helmet on. Oh, he didn't that guy doesn't have a helmet on. You're right. All right. Now, a football helmet was not required until 1937, oh, so they didn't have to wear them. Wow. So this guy and his buddy there don't have helmets on. Now, this is what I call a football move. Oh, wow. That's what happens to the guys that don't wear those helmets. <laughs> and uh, so here's, here's a good picture of a... Uh, Probably a player in the 1930s that played football and so on and so forth and banged up nose. Might have taken a few shots. Uh, this is an advertisement for football equipment that's sold at Montana Hardware. Now this was during that guy could have gone to the Montana Hardware, bought a football helmet from somewhere between two and eleven dollars wow. at that time. Now we're just showing a little update again. This is a Grizzly football player in about 1930. Does anybody recognize it? It's Bill Hawk. Oh. Yeah. The teacher? The teacher, correct. Yeah, I have yes. him as a teacher. Yeah. The big question I have is how come he doesn't have a football? Because <laughs> he wore a helmet. Yeah. Yeah. All right, then just as a comparison, this is a modern day football helmet worn by a Butte High football player this fall. Remember, these ranged anywhere from $2 to $11. This helmet costs $300. I was going to say hundreds of dollars. Yeah, $300. Just a little side note there. Wow. Now we're back to the games again. Uh, you notice we're not emphasizing who's winning or who's losing. Uh, the whole object was to look at not whether you win or lose, it's just how the event went on as far as Butte was concerned. Crowds again. Uh, this one doesn't show a lot of good football action, but things are going on. But the interesting thing is, <coughs> Look at the people sitting on the <laughs> watching the game. <laughs> that, <laughs> is that you? <laughs> that, that was an electricity pole, too. That is not an empty pole. There are wires and everything. There's another picture later on that will show that a little bit closer. Wow. All right. Now, this is what I consider a classic football picture. I don't know, there's a, there's a football coach back there, <laughs> I know, but uh, if I was to select any picture as far as football is concerned and show it to some probably offensive linemen, I'd show them this picture. Coaches emphasize from day one, they used to, now they don't because they all stand up to block down, right Bob? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You used to emphasize, keep your pad, your pads low, the lower man's gonna win. All right, look at this. White helmet, white helmet, white helmet, white helmet. Look at where all their helmets are at. Their pad level is lower. So that gives credit to the Bobcat coaches on that one. Because these are the Bobcats. <laughs> this is another action photo. Uh, cross body block, which is illegal now. Can't do that. This is just a good picture of action. Shows the grandstand, shows the East Ridge, shows what's going on in Clark Park, 1929. This is another picture, action picture. There's those people still, they didn't get electrocuted yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Another action photograph. I know that in 1928, the Grizzlies wore white helmets and black jerseys. So these are the Grizzlies, the other team is the Bobcats. Just a little throw in the, the field at Butte High School now, which is a turf field. 
and uh, the difference between what they were playing on then and what they're playing on now. Just to show a little close up of the deal. This is 1935, captains before the game, and the officials. We have a white hat, black hat, and two no hats. Okay. <laughs> This guy to me looks like he's getting ready to fight instead of fishing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, action photo again. Here's a shot of the field. These are the two bands in 1936. This is probably halftime. If I remember right, the two bands still get on the field together at halftime. It's a Bobcat band. Bobcat band director. I don't know who he is. This is their drum major, and this lady is in charge of their drum and bugle corps. That's both from Montana State. It's 1936 captains. The no hats are gone. We just have a white hat and a dark hat. The two captains. Bobcats are wearing the striped socks. That's Bobcats. Wow. All right, now, does anyone know who this is? Bill Popovich oh. from Butte. Uh, outstanding football player for the University of Montana. Uh, the headlines at, of this particular game stated that uh, Popovich stole the show. Uh, he hogged the press and all that. <laughs> he scored two touchdowns in this game. and. Uh, got quite a bit of ink for it. Uh, but again, it shows, uh, look at the size of the football. It's like a pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sleek, cleated cleats. shoes, look at the cleats. I was like, it stepped on with those. And they're huge. Another action Ow. photo. Now this shows the grandstands. This would be on the east side. Nature's. <laughs> oh, bleach. 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 Okay. Bleach. All right. There's a close up. There's those. Sit down there. So that, that is a power pole, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know that much about it, but I don't know if I want to be a portion of it. This is a student section. This is the Montana State here, the cheerleaders. Now, an interesting point, too, is that there was no uh, electric uh, loudspeakers at Clark's Park until 1930. So you went through the 1926, 27, 28, and 29 games without loudspeakers. Wow. So, I don't know what the people, how did they, how did they heard the game, whether somebody went around with a megaphone, megaphone and yelled <laughs> what was going on or what. Wow. But you know what probably happened? At halftime, these people probably had a shot out of their bottles and that and talked to one another. <laughs> they didn't have cell phones or they didn't have anything like that. They just yeah. talked with one another during the halftime. <laughs> and you know what else is missing on this picture? We don't have five guys here in the front row with their shirts off <laughs> yeah. and having grizz written across yeah. their hats written across them. They're all them with a stomach hanging down. It didn't exist. All right, another action game. Check the dust. A little silicosis. <laughs> now who's in the stripes? Socks? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Good, good. Cheerleaders? Male. Male, exactly right. Yeah. All the male cheerleaders. Yeah, that is interesting. Action photo again, but the interesting part in this photo is there's people all the way around here on the inside, and then there's people all the way here on top of the fence, or up above the fence, looking over the top. <laughs> I assume that what they did is drive their cars in there and stood on top of their cars. Because that was a parking lot back in the area. 
and then cars in 1930 were roofs were probably a little stronger than they are now. Another action photo, dust. And now, in 1938, the game moved from uh, Clark Park up to Butte High Stadium. So we'll look a little bit about the parades and the crowds up town a little bit. And there's the drum majorettes and the police chief again. That's the MSU color guard. This is the. Pardon me? Go back. Go back. <coughs> no, go up. I thought that said 49 Plymouth Woods. No, it's 39. It's hidden by the flag. Yeah. 1939 Plymouth, it's a, it's a firecracker. Hotter than a firecracker. This is the Drum and Bugle Corps from Montana State, all women. This is a uh, float from Montana State. The Grizzly will lead them. And these are all. Uh, there are all kinds of ways to describe them. <laughs> Honey pots, so. uh, bed pan, bed pots, whatever you want to call them. Chamber pots. Chamber, Chamber pots, pot. yes. right. <laughs> Anybody know what this building is? First National Bank. First National Bank, right. Oh. No, this is, I assume the police chief again. <laughs> so the, he's he's the girls. I think she's from Montana State. She's from the university. I think this girl may be from a high school band. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of high school bands and that in the parades at that time. Uh, this is Montana State. Yeah. Man coming down the street, going west on Broadway. I think. This is a high school group that was in the parade. I can't identify who they were. It might have been high school, I'm not sure. Uh, this is uh, the University of Montana band, Park in Maine again. But the interesting thing that I kept seeing in these pictures is the amount of people that were at these parades. Right. You know, it's always noted for parades, but it just seemed like the town really turned out for this game, supported it. That's MSU's band, Park and Maine again. This band, I think, is from some other organization other than the two schools. And this was in 1941. Uh, this is a float, 1941, I don't know, some group or something. This is a sign advertising a dance at the Temple Ballroom after the Bobcat Grizzly game, and that was for students. The Temple Ballroom was at the Masonic Temple, down in the basement of the Masonic Temple. Again, number of people at the parade, looking west on Park Street. Snake dance was usually the thing that ended the parades back in this day. This is kind of an interesting picture. Uh, these are cheerleaders from MSC, which would be Montana State College. I, I don't know whether they're trying to stop this, whether they're trying to cheer, get them to cheer, or whether they're trying to stop them. <laughs> Oh, these guys look like they're looking for a fight. <laughs> this guy here, and this guy looks like... So I can't decide whether they're trying to stop them or cheer them on, one or the other. Okay, then we go to the games at Butte High Stadium. The first game at Butte High Stadium was uh, November 7th, 1938, and it was was cold, very cold. <laughs> Look at the yeah, light around there. Uh, they moved to, up to Butte High Stadium because they thought they could see 10,000 people in that stadium, but the crowd was very sparse. Only about 8,000 people showed up that night because of the cold. That was the last time they tried a night game. 
and went back to afternoon games. All right, those are our officials for the 1939 game. We go the Dark Hat, three no hats again. Uh, this is the Grizzly captain, and this is the Wildcat captain. We tried to, to see if we could identify individual players in that, but it, it would take years to do that. Some action at the 1939 game. They did throw the ball once in a while. <laughs> I'm sure this guy, I think, threw it. Uh, I don't know where it's going, but uh, he's getting a little pressure. Uh, this is a uh, picture of the sidelines in the 1939 game. Notice that the f fence on the east side of the stadium was all blocked off. This was corrugated tin so that you couldn't see through. Oh. The thing, but Jim again said there's no way they know how to speak. I don't know about 39. But this is interesting. Here's the yard marker. It's a steel piece of steel spike, probably a piece of rebar from the athletic company, sharpened up and then stuck in the ground. Wow. Nowadays they have all kinds of fancy soft yeah. stuff so nobody gets hurt in that. In those days they didn't quite worry about that. But there's the heads of all the people looking over the fence. <laughs> <laughs> Here's how they hit it. They parked their cars oh, yeah. on Wyoming Street, gone up on the top of the cars, on the top of the truck, and looked over the fence. Wow. I don't know how many of you remember going to football games at Butte High, but there was never a football game that there wasn't a dog on it. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's the dog right there. I'm going to put him through that hole right there. Uh, I think pic uh, Smithers took a picture of his competition here. This is another photographer. Oh. And I think it might have been eyeballing him. <laughs> Uh, wow. This is a, the bench a in a 1940 game. Uh, I believe this is the Bobcat bench. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about something in a minute. But notice the water bucket, the sanitary conditions of the water bucket. <laughs> yeah. There's bottles. All you did is take that off. There's a big dipper in there. Everybody just took it, dip the water, put it back in. This is a panoramic, kind of a panoramic view of uh, the Butte High Stadium then. There's bleachers there, bleachers all along that side to get 10,000 people in there. Action photo again. Notice the crowd. And then an interesting thing here, if you go to a game now, you look up in the crowd, you can very definitely determine who is for who. Yeah. Because they have all the school colors on mm -hmm. and all this and that, but pretty tough to tell who's for what team on that particular picture. This is another picture of the bench. If you notice these two benches, I don't know how many of you are real strong football fans, but if you notice the sidelines of a football game now, it's like a madhouse. Yeah. I mean, there are people going every which way. Yeah. And they're all sitting down. They played both ways in those days, so when they came out of the game, they probably wanted a place to sit down. <laughs> so they sat down. Another action photo. This is Montana State. This is the University of Montana. Montana State had a helmet that was kind of like Michigan's helmet at that time. Look, look at the crowd. <laughs> This is the Grizzly sideline. Uh, this is Deep Dalbert, one of the coaches. But again, they're all sitting down, it's kind of quiet, pretty calm on the sideline. Bands at halftime. If you notice, there's a loudspeaker truck here. I don't know if the stadium had loudspeakers at that particular time or not, whether they just broadcast from that truck. Another action photo. Another action photo in 1941. 
that's a good good action photo. A little dust cloud here. So, uh, guys using the form I think they're trying to teach nowadays. Tap with your head behind the guy, not in front of it anymore. Uh, then we switch to the post-war years. From 19, they played a game in 1941. Then 42, 43, 44, and 45, there was no game because of the war. So we go to a post-war era, and the first game was back in 1946. And still had the parades uptown. This is a Montana State band. White's Garage. Anybody know what this building is? Funeral home. Funeral home. Huh? Funeral home. Funeral home. Funeral home. Funeral home. Sherman yeah. and Reed. Yeah. Sherman and Reed's funeral home. And underneath it was a was the white garage. And there was a Texaco gas station right inside the garage itself. This is a uh, university. Montana band going down Main Street in 1950. This, now you, Smithers probably at this particular time is in the building that uh, held the Texaco offices. This Texaco had big offices here in View at that time. They moved up to Alaska Street later on, but I can't remember the name of that building. It's where the Prudential Bank is now. I don't remember what it was then. But he was, up in, he was up in that building someplace. Mm. Now he's across the street on the other side. This is a MSU band. This is Blind Frank's newsstand right there. Anybody remember him? Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's across the street now. Uh, this is a fraternity in the parade. University of Montana band, snake dance ending up with grape. That time, this is a folk. We've been, we've been on the U. The funny story is, I looked at this picture for about two months and I never could figure out what this was. I kept asking, what's the EWE stand for? And finally, somebody told me. You did? Was it you? Yeah. All right. Uh, majorettes from Montana State, probably in the 46, 47 era. This is a picture of Smithers. It's got right down on the ground. Took the picture through a tuba. The tuba. tuba, wasn't it? A tuba? Or tuba. Or, uh, yeah. Is that the right instrument? Yeah. Tuba? tuba. At, uh, I think she's from Montana State. I don't know where she's from. I think this girl is from University of Montana. But kind of look at the look she's giving this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little <laughs> <almost there. laughs> yeah. Took another picture. Through the tuba on the ground. All right, I'm going to take the games. Uh, again, playing on a dirt field. Now, that field in Naranchi Stadium was prepared. They plowed it up, uh, they added sawdust to it, mixed it all up, and leveled it off. So it wasn't quite as bad as hard as uh, Clark Park was. Yeah. Oh, wait, that press box. Yeah, right. They outside. built another press box up on top. This was the original press box. I think at this particular time they were starting to probably broadcast them radio all the time, and more than one radio station was broadcasting, so they had to have room for two or three radio stations. Uh, some of you remember the old new carriage work, people hiding up in the <laughs> windows. There's, there's a good story about the carriage work in football. Uh, action photo. Uh, this is kind of an interesting photo. Uh, you know, a lot of contact being made here. The guy has his ear ear hole in his helmet taped shut. Now, I've known him to do that when it's cold, when it's oh. real cold. They'll oh. do that. 
It's not cold that day. What I think happened is one time when this guy was in the game, he was on the ground, and somebody took a handful of dirt and put it right in his ear. So he taped his ear shut so he couldn't get the dirt in his ear. Wow. This, this poor guy here got his nose all taped up. If you look at this call, I keep looking at that. I think he got hit hard enough that his helmet's on backwards. This is a program from 1949, 25 cents. This is a kind of a view of the game. I believe this game was probably in 1950, one of the last games, or the last game to be played. But they had taken down all the tin, and look at the people outside looking at the game. And uh, we have a couple of theories on that. They might have done that just to show that there's X number of more people that want to get to these games. Uh, and I'm not sure why they did it. This is, uh, I think, the 1950 game. Um, incidental contact. No pass interference there. Uh, here's the people standing outside again. Get a good shot of the field. Each side of the hill. Now, wow. this was uh, Dorn Blazer Field in 1938. Uh, they're, they're pointing this out is this side of the stadium there probably could seat around 3,500 people. There was no bleachers on this side of the field. All right, this is a picture of Dorn Blazer Field in 1950. Wow. Large bleachers built on that would be the east side. The same bleachers on the west side. So they up there attendance to probably around 9,000 people or so. Wow. So that's when you get into this, there was a little conflict that occurred as to why the game left Butte. And uh, the trend was at that particular time, during, through the, clear through the 1920s and 30s, up until even today, of building larger stadiums on campuses. and. Uh, that's kind of what we feel was one of the reasons why the game left Butte, is because both schools had built larger stadiums on their own campuses. So they're saying, well, we better just have people in those stadiums to justify the expense of building it. And then there was a conflict with the Chamber of Commerce. And, uh, the, game, the 1950 got one game was all planned clear up, it was ready to go until July of 1951. And then in July of 1951, uh, they just said, yeah, they said that, uh, yeah, they didn't want, uh, they were gonna go back to their own stadiums and play in 52. They said, we're gonna go back to our own stadiums in 52. So, what, uh, the View Chamber of Commerce and that, they just said, oh, we don't want the game in 51 either. So they just wrote the game off in 51. Oh. They had to go back to their own stadiums in 51. So it just kind of with a clash of wills or something. And the game ended in 1950. But there's a caveat to that. In 1959, I happened to be a freshman at the University of Montana there, and we played the Bobcat in Naranchi Stadium that year. Uh -huh. So there was another Bobcat Grizzly game after 1950. Mm -hmm. Just not very well publicized. Wow. We didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 12 to 6. Uh, the Cubs. <laughs> so that kind of ended the Bobcat Grizzly game in, in view. And like I said, our purpose was not to, to uh, point out who the winners and loser was. I think our purpose in this whole thing was to show the skill of Smithers as far as a historical photographer 
just in one little phase, yeah. the, this game, just one phase, well, how you could spend hours and hours just on this alone. And you start looking at some of his other stuff and you've got hours and hours and hours to spend looking at that. So it's been, been fun and I've really enjoyed doing it. Yeah. Any questions? What did I tell you about the other day? You didn't mention. Well, that was a day ago. <laughs> <laughs> the pig pen. Oh, the pig pens. All right. Oh, we got to talk about the pig pen. At both Clark Park and Butte High School Stadium. And there's another. I got to tell you a little bit now. Okay, we're going to the pig pens. <laughs> there was a place that they kind of roped off, fenced off, which they call the pig pen, and they put all the kids. If you were a kid running around, they put you in the pig pen. <laughs> we, were, we were talking yesterday. If you go to a Butte High School game now and you go up in the stand up in the back, there are junior high kids running all over the place. And, but they used to take those kids and put them down in the pig pen. <laughs> and you would be in that pig pen and it was fenced off and everything was legal there. <laughs> I mean, fighting, spitting, everything. And they had one at. Uh, Car oh, Park too, funny. out in the back of Car Park, they had a big pen out there. <laughs> so they used to just round, those, round the kids that didn't have parents, ship them to the big pen. <laughs> that's where you stay. And they had paddle clubs at both schools, uh, Central and Butte High, and they walked around with paddles. And I mean, they were wood paddles. Wow. And I mean, if you were out of order, you got whacked in the rear end Jeez. and sent to the pig pen. Right? <laughs> yeah. Huh? The Chilean club. Yeah, the Chilean club. So that's how the order was kept as far as this. And Ugrin was in the pig pen all the time. <laughs> yeah, when did uh, Smithers quit actively taking pictures? The 19, early 1970s. 71 and 72 around there. And then his son took over, right? Yes. Because he took, over, took right. pictures when I was in high school. Yeah. But I know Bob points out that when he was going to high school, he thought Smithers was part of the faculty down there because he was there all the time taking pictures, yeah. constantly taking pictures. Of everything. Of everything. Yeah. I mean, he, there's collections of all the school clubs uh, that they had, you know, French club. And he has pictures of all that. You can, you can go through anything you want wow. and find some information. Yes? I was telling Sheila, I thought I had a memory of the Captors game being in youth during my lifetime, but she was saying they have scrimmages here every year? Oh, they have scrimmages here, yeah. spring, spring scrimmages. Yes, they do have those. Yeah. But no games? No games, no, no, yes. not, not since 1959. <laughs> 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 Any other questions, <laughs> comments? Didn't the, didn't the freshman teams play at Tech sometime during the late 60s, early 70s? But, uh, they could, they could yeah. Yeah, yeah 1969. 70, 70 was up there. 70 in oh, town. I didn't know that. Yeah, the Cubs and the Kittens. They still have freshman teams out? Yeah. The Cubs and the Kittens. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, that <laughs> that's funny. I didn't sure know that. Uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of red shirting going oh. on. Bob Beers uh, it was is an ex coach, coached the Grizzlies, been in the pro football ranks for a while, and that lives here in Butte now. Bob, stand up. Let everybody Hi. see him. Oh. I'm surprised he wasn't on me all the time. He <laughs> coached you. Huh? You coached me over there. So. <laughs> I know. <laughs> how, old, how old do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for attending.